Hello everyone and welcome to The Green Flame, the deep green resistance broadcast that brings you radical analysis, practical skills, and artistic expression from the revolutionary movement to defend the planet and rebuild just human communities. I am your host and comrade Max Wilbert. I was ultimately captured based on uh, being charged with false charges. I was captured. I was shot with my hands in the air. I was shot in the back. I was tortured, beaten, spent two years in solitary confinement in men's prisons because of my political beliefs. I was spent six and a half years in prison in the United States and what I learned about prison in the United States that it's a new form of plantation, it's a new form of slavery. The United States is becoming more and more a police state in which prisons are nothing more than concentration camps. Welcome to the Green Flame. On this episode, the Deep Green Resistance Book Club discusses Asada, an autobiography by Asada Shakur. We wish to express our gratitude to Asada Shakur. In addition, we thank the Freedom Archives for the Vinyl Project. Quote, The Vinyl Project is a tool for DJs, musicians, MCs, activists, and most of all, the people. The sound bites on this record include chilling voices on repression and glimmering declarations of resistance. The Vinyl Project Collective hopes these sounds will nourish your beats, melodies, and community. End quote. The DGR community is so nourished by being able to share three cuts on the vinyl project. Black Panther Party Kids Power to the People and Asada's Voice, New Form of Plantation and My Beliefs. You can find the Freedom Archives at freedomarchives.org. And now, this episode of The Green Flame. I'm an African woman who believes in freedom and justice, social justice, political justice, economic justice for all people. I believe that oppressed people, wherever they are, have the right to self-determination. I believe that the priorities of this planet have to be completely changed. Let's just go ahead and start with a first round then uh, for folks who have read the book. What things stood out to you most from Asada's description of her childhood experiences growing up in pretty racially segregated South at times and then in, at times in New York where there was still plenty of, plenty of um, racial segregation going on in other ways? I, I guess I'll jump in and start then. The, the thing that stands out most to me from her growing up experiences that I read is her description of running away at age 12 and pretty easily being able to find a job as a 12 year old working in a bar to chat up the male customers and keep them buying drinks. Uh, and then just other, yeah, other things from that time of her when she had, had run away, including uh, being kind of lured into the apartment of, of a young man who and under pretenses of going to a party who then invited a bunch of his young male friends over to gang rape her and she managed to get out of the situation eventually by by threatening to kind of tear up the apartment as she heard him you know she used what she heard him saying to his friends like don't mess up, don't mess up my apartment man my mom will kill me she used that that information to um to get herself out of there eventually but that was yeah just reading that was terrifying to me Anyway, that's what sticks out most to me of her, of her growing up experiences. One quote that really stuck out to me is she writes, I hate war and I hate having to struggle. I honestly do because I wish I had been born into a world where it was unnecessary. This context of struggle and being a warrior and being a struggler has been forced on me by oppression. Otherwise, I would be a sculptor or a gardener, carpenter, you know, I would be free to be so much more. I guess part of me or a part of who I am, a part of what I do is being a warrior, a reluctant warrior, a reluctant struggler, but I do it because I'm committed to life. That quote just struck me very powerfully when I read it because I have a similar feeling. You know, I wish that I hadn't been born into a world where industrial civilization was destroying the fabric of life itself and patriarchy is just brutally tearing its way through our communities and 
you know, all these systems of oppression, you know, are, are pretty terrible. I, I truly wish that I lived in a world where we were living in peace and in a good way with each other and with the land. And I could just hang out with my friends and hang out with my family. And, you know, it's not like I don't enjoy those things. I love to just chill, chill out and be with the people I love and do artistic and creative things. And, you know, the basic necessities of life and spend time with kids and raising young people and being outside. And, you know, that's a, that's a powerful motivation at the same time, of course, because all of those things are under threat. Those, those lives are under threat and the future generations are under threat. So I definitely feel what she's saying about, I do it because I'm committed to life. Yeah. So, uh, she drives so I think they drive from New York to her home state I forgot this name of the state but um yeah and they could not stop anywhere in between to get food or water because of segregation and also the part where they they run a, hood, a breakfast place right or a restaurant and um uh, and people would come and vandalize things or yeah basically like terrorize them also like the way how um corporate policies affected where people lived and everything and how it shapes present day United States. So yeah, so yeah, that that was very interesting. Yeah, thank you. I think one of the things that hit me pretty strongly, and I've read the book twice now, because I, I find it so fascinating as a study in how you how a, a, a real revolutionary behaves and develops, is um, the fact that as a young child, she internalized already all these raci- racial stereotypes that it was, it was all in there and had been indoctrinated into her at such an early age. And that was um, what hit me most powerfully about her early childhood and how quickly that happens. Ross, do you have anything? It did come up for me when someone else was talking there, just how much her peers were, like I remember there's this, she talks about time that she spent on the beach and all her peers were just, uh, just wanting to conform, just mm-hmm. focused on getting drunk and just doing the same just wanting to conform to the mainstream culture basically and she just really couldn't relate and she just had to literally walk away because she was like just blown away by I suppose the uh maybe naivety or just yeah just general conformity of of the people around her yeah thank you that kind of leads into the the next segment which is her her young adulthood and kind of coming into political consciousness that 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 you just described, Ross, um, is as, yeah, it seems like as she's kind of beginning that that process of, yeah, she she's done the thing of getting a job and, and getting into the mainstream culture of, okay, this is what people do, I guess, and starts hanging out with Black friends who, yeah, who mostly are looking to aspire to whatever the, the dominant culture says says are the things to aspire to. And she she has a real sense that that's not what she wants. Um, and that's, that's not what's important to her. Um, so then moving, yeah, so moving into, into that space of her life, what things stand out to you in terms of coming into some political consciousness? I guess one of the things that stands out to me is when she's sitting around the table with a couple of politically acute friends, and mm-hmm. she's a total ignoramus, mm-hmm. and they just they just laugh at her. And then they start telling her what's going on, and it, it struck me that it's such a human thing to be, is um, to be blind to it and then to be fortunate enough to encounter those that can can take you farther. Mm-hmm. Some of that, you know, there's, there's that spirit of, of fight in her that in her story she talks about from the very beginning, the ability that the fighting spirit is already there. And then she just encounters a lot of the right people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that sticks with me too, what you just described. And of her really being very loyal to the narrative that she was raised with. You know, we're, we're doing the right, like the United States, we, you know, she was, she was very um, associated herself as, as loyal to the United States government and, and the, the good fight that they were putting forward in, in Vietnam or in other places in the world. And yeah, that was, I, I enjoyed reading that of her, you know, sticking up for what, what she was taught to believe and then having friends who were kind enough to, um, <laughs> to go ahead and, and challenge her and, and educate, help, help to start educating her on that. One thing that I remember from the book, I might be remembering it wrong, but maybe I'm not. It seemed like the knowledge of past 
struggles against oppression was quite important to her formation of her political mind. And I think so us in turn learning about her struggles is also important. And I think part of resisting is learning about other resistances against oppression. And it's kind of not it's not seen as good as as actual action, but I think it's probably just as important to to know about other other resistance movements and other um, f- struggles against oppression. And it seemed to be quite important for her too. Yeah, I'm recalling on that note, um, her discussion of, of the Black Panther Party's education program and saying that that, that was a, a, a hole in their education program is that they, when they were at teaching cadre, the skills that they considered necessary for cadre, uh, it didn't seem to include that kind of historical context like a real broad-based revolutionary um, history kind of a context and that she felt that was extremely important. Yeah, one of the quotes that is a short one that I've shared from this book when we do direct action trainings and DGR trainings and we talk about grand strategy and sort of having a big picture for the movement, the vision that you're trying to achieve is to win any struggle for liberation, you have to have the way as well as the will an overall ideology and strategy that stem from a scientific analysis of history and present conditions. What else is coming up for people in terms of, and these two things kind of bleed together, but um, her coming into political consciousness and, um, and then being politically active in the Black Liberation Movement? For me, it was really beneficial to hear her perspective being a woman in that movement, because I'm sure I haven't read, other, I haven't read any other accounts of the Black Panther Party or the Black Liberation Movement, but uh, I'm sure if it, if I read something by a man, it would probably be a very different perspective because uh, you got a very good. I think she gave quite a good impression of kind of the patriarchy that's inherent was inherent in the movement and kind of the authoritarianism, which for me would go hand in hand with regards to the the very uh, kind of authoritarian leadership roles. I think she comments at some point that one of the leaders was uh, had his own like expensive flat for security purposes and and. Yeah, I, I just appreciate that perspective and it helps you critique things then from uh, critique what went wrong with that movement and what was wrong at its core. And I suppose that connects as well to the to what you were talking about with the history. If you're not if you're not aware of the history and how things have failed in the past and how things have worked, then you're just going to repeat those same mistakes. And for me, that's kind of the impression I got. Again, I don't know a huge amount of the history, but the impression I got was that the vision inherent there in the movement wasn't really... It might have been called revolutionary, but there were many things that weren't, there were many holes in their, in their perspective that maybe needed questioning for, for real change to have happened. Ignoring the massive oppression of the state, of course, that they, that they received as well, which obviously didn't help. Um, it's hard for me to even know how to begin because it all feeds into the narrative of her life. But one of the things that really struck me about the political organizing is once again, the blunders. I mean, in the same way that, you know, she made a fool out of herself and she's so honest. And then she had these politically savvy people educating her. You know, she describes this scene where they're out there running around in the park, you know, acting like total idiots, just making themselves a huge target for the state and for the cops and for everybody. And then in solidarity, this other group comes over and says, wait a minute, you know, you just don't do that. Do you realize what you're doing? And that, that solidarity is a very practical matter. And that, uh, it, it, that was just beautiful. And once again, her narrative is so unique. And that piece about being a woman in the movement chases her throughout the entire story. I've had the honor of interviewing a formerly incarcerated political prisoner and then lived with one for a while. So what you're saying about the the patriarchal nature of it, that piece, I know because I've ex- I experienced it in a person who was incarcerated for over 40 years. And yeah, he was definitely sexist and it was definitely there. And so just because you're a revolutionary doesn't mean that there aren't some of those elements. And then the other one was um, interviewing a woman who had children and then had to suffer the way that, that Asada did in being separated from her child. The oppression of women is different and pervasive wherever you are. Thanks, Jennifer. Angela, what are your thoughts? 
So in regards to her political, coming into political arena, I would say, I think maybe her school life and a lot of things that have to do with her identity probably shape a lot of her thinking. So I, I would say like she talked about how she was one of the few Black students in her school in New York and how that affected how the teachers interacted with her. And also uh, things about how... Uh, so uh, just her hair, she, I, I remember I, I, there was a part about her hair. I think there was certain ideas for what a professional hair should look like or like how a person should be in terms of their hair. And I think all, a lot of that just affected, like, I think, yeah, it, we, it probably was very challenging. And all of that was political in a way too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Could I add something? Mm-hmm. Yes, please. Yeah, what comes up for me from a couple of those comments is I'm reminded of, yeah, that park scene, it reminds me of the impression I get of her and the reason the book is so effective and just goes into so much depth is because you, you really get the impression that, and probably what helped in her political evolution and perspective was she seems to have a really inquisitive mind. I get the impression she's questioning a lot of stuff and she talks about having like the liberation movement being very insular and her really wanting to connect with other movements and that, yeah, that park scene is where she's, I think she's talking about that park scene that she's just getting drunk and messing around with friends. And she's been trying to connect with, I don't know which, I think it's some kind of one of the Asian revolutionary yeah. movements at the time. And then they actually are the ones who rescue her from, rescue her and her friends kind of maturely give them some advice. You need to kind of get out of here because you're going to get in trouble with the cops if you're hanging about messing around. And the impression I get from the book is that she was quite driven in that sense. Yeah, I, I am looking at page 202 to 203 in, in my version of the book. She says, it was obvious It was obvious my stuff was raggedy and that I needed to get my act together. If I wanted to call myself a revolutionary, I was going to have to earn the title. I had heard somebody say that revolutionaries get high on revolution and that it was the best high in the world. I'm going to check out that high, I said aloud. This is as she's kind of separating from her friends who had who had been rescued by the Asian brothers. Huh, what'd you say? Her, her friends are asking. Uh, nothing, I answered. I was just talking out loud. Oh, somebody said, I can dig it. So they're, they're kind of starting to take their separate ways. And then she says, revolution is about change. And the first place the change begins is in yourself. That, that scene stood out a lot to me as well. And, and that, um, yeah, as you were saying, Ross, her, her personal conviction that that, that needed to be a, to include the, that kind of personal change in herself so that she could be an effective revolutionary. Yeah, Michelle, just to play off that a little bit, and Ross and Angela, what you were saying too. When I was at my poorest period in life, like six or seven years ago, I was like studying personal finance stuff because I just needed to figure out how to not be so broke. (laughs) And one of the people said, one of the things they said was like, okay, here are all these ways to save money and here are all these ways to cut your expenses and stuff. But they rec- the person recommended, I don't recommend that you track how much money you spend on books because a book is like the distilled knowledge of one person's mind. You know, it's like when you make, when you write a book, you're really focusing and you're taking what you think are your most important ideas and you're putting it down. And so this personal finance person was saying, you know, don't count books for your budget because that's an investment in your mind and in yourself. And I was just thinking about this as I'm reading the Asada book, because you can really see her political evolution, right? And her maturation as a person going through all these experiences personally and politically. And like by the end of the book, she's this wise revolutionary woman who's been fighting for decades, you know, and has been through a lot and has seen a lot, you know, both wonderful things and huge mistake. Yeah. It just makes me think that like, Ever since the first time I read this book, I thought this is one that all of us should be studying, you know, because you can learn a lot from that history. And I think that's what she's trying to do in the book is she's trying to teach people from her own successes and her own mistakes and, uh, you know, and help speed up people's learning curve. So, I mean, this should really be like a textbook for revolutionaries. I feel like uh, there's so much in here. I, I agree with that completely. And it, just to maybe bring a close, unless other people have stuff that they want to say to the beginning of coming into political consciousness. Once again, she says, I thought about it all the way home. This is at the end of a chapter of all the things I had wanted to be when I was a little girl. 
a revolutionary, revolutionary certainly wasn't one of them. And now it was the only thing I wanted to do. Everything else was secondary. It occurred to me that even though I wanted to become a revolutionary more than anything else in the world, I still didn't have the slightest idea what I would have to do to become one. And all of the eyes are lowercase. That's one of the things that strikes me about this book. It's <laughs> everything is intentional. I agree with Max totally about that. And there's as much information for becoming a serious revolutionary, revolutionary in what she says, as what she doesn't say, as how she says it, it's all there. That's one thing that just blew me away about this, is she is a real revolutionary. And I never read somebody that told a story like this or has become this. So yeah, what other, what other things stand out to folks about what she describes of, of the Black Liberation Movement itself? There are so many things. Yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I can throw out a couple. I don't know if people have responses to them, but one is I think she has one of the clearest and best articulations of the importance of the firewall between above ground and underground. When she writes, one of the party, one of the Black Panther Party's major weaknesses was the failure to clearly differentiate between above ground political struggle and underground clandestine military struggle. An above ground political organization can't wage guerrilla war any more than an underground army can do above ground political work. Although the two must work together, they must have completely different structures. You can't say it any better than that. And that's one reason why we actually took that quote and it's on the security culture page on the Deep Green Resistance website now when we talk about the firewall, because we want people to know, you know, we're not just making up this idea of a firewall to like, protect ourselves and keep ourselves away from the danger or something like that. The firewall is a, you know, a hard fought and hard won idea that was born out of, you know, the reality of the blood and turmoil and jail time of political struggles that made the mistake of not, you know, instituting a good firewall system like that and not compartmentalizing different avenues of struggle into different organizational structures. I'm going to read just a little piece at the end of page 243 in the version of the book that I've got. She says, and although I felt that the major task of the underground should be organizing and building, I didn't feel that armed acts of resistance should be ruled out. As long as they didn't impede our long range plans, guerrilla units should be able to carry out a few well-planned, well-timed armed actions that were well-coordinated with above ground political objectives not any old kind of actions, but actions that black people would clearly understand and support and actions that were well publicized in the black community. So I'm interested in, um, she says that from her perspective, she's saying she feels that the major task of the underground should be organizing and building. What, what do you think she means by that underground organizing and building? And then with a few strategically, you know, coordinated with what they can see is going on in, in the above ground movement, more strategic armed attacks. Oh, I can take a stab at that if you want, Michelle. Yeah, I uh, love that. I think the strategy that she's working with and the strategy of the Black Panthers more generally was really informed by the Chinese and the Maoist strategy. And, you know, Maoism is based on this idea of protracted people's warfare, where you uh, essentially what they did in China was they started building a political base, an underground political base in the rural communities in the farming areas among the peasants and the poor people, which, which made up the vast bulk of the Chinese population at the time. And they did that over years, over the course of years, they built up this base in the, you know, the rural peasantry. And then they started expanding that across the country. And basically they avoided fighting the, the, you know, the ruling class, the ruling power structures and the government for as long as they could because the longer they delayed those fights, generally the more power they were able to build in those communities. So there's a quote in the book actually where she talks about this a little bit, not using that exact language, but she says, revolutionary war is protracted warfare. It is impossible for us to win quickly. To win, we have got to wear down our oppressors little, little by little, and at the same time, strengthen our forces slowly but surely. I understood some of my more impatient sisters and brothers. I knew that it was tempting to substitute military for political struggle, 
especially since all our above ground organizations were under vicious attack by the FBI, the CIA, and the local police agencies. All of us who saw our leaders murdered, our people shot down in cold blood, felt a need, a desire to fight back. One of the hardest lessons we had to learn is that revolutionary struggle is scientific rather than emotional. I'm not saying we shouldn't feel anything, but decisions can't be based on love or on anger. They have to be based on the objective conditions and what's the rational and emotional thing to do. So I'm not a Maoist, but understanding a little bit about that strategy, I by no means would say I'm an expert. I haven't really studied it in detail, but I think that's kind of what she was meaning by that, by that sort of political organizing approach to underground work. And I think that, you know, there are, there are a lot of parallels between that and the DGR strategy, the DEW strategy, but there are also some significant divergences, obviously. Yeah, just when I read those words, organizing and building, those are things that that I think of as being more above ground things. So yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, Max. I guess what's coming, what I'm getting from what you've said is when when the state is going to repress even what what seemed like they they might be um, in in my understanding of the word um, above ground tactics like educating people and just talking and but if the state's gonna gonna repress free speech to that extent then those things have to be underground as well in terms of building organization. I just had one more quick thing yeah. about the the underground organizing element, yeah. Michelle, and what you said. Yeah. I read a biography of Fidel Castro a couple of years ago, and I'm not a, not a struggle that I would totally idealize and not a person that I would totally idealize a lot of different problems and a lot of issues in that movement from top to bottom, but, you know, also a struggle that was very successful, obviously, and a lot to learn from. And one of the, you're talking about underground and organizing and building, and one of the things that struck me so powerfully from that book is the stories of how in the lead up to the first failed attack on the barracks at Moncada in Cuba. So there was this, you know, failed first attack and then Fidel was forced to flee the country and was in Mexico for years. And that's when they took the little boat across to Cuba. And it's sort of the iconic story of landing with whatever 22 people on their boat and then, you know, having a successful revolution from there, starting with this really small group of, you know, poorly supplied people landing on the beach in the mountains and taking over the entire country. But before the first attack in Moncada, it was amazing to read about the groundwork that they were doing to build the revolutionary spirit and to recruit people. Apparently, Fidel Castro had literally thousands and thousands of conversations with people in the lead up to this. Like he was meeting with people basically from dawn till dusk every single day, just explaining the strategy to them, convincing them to join the struggle, answering any questions they had. It was like a, almost like canvassing door to door or something like that. You know, it was like this very grassroots, very simple recruitment strategy of just, we're going to find people who are somewhat interested and then we're going to have conversations with them one by one by one by one, thousands upon thousands of them. And hopefully they'll talk to their friends about it and so on. That was why when they landed with 22 people, they didn't just have 22 people. They had allies and friends and potential recruits all over the entire country because they'd done that foundational work of talking with so many people. And I just want to say something briefly, too, about, I don't know if it flows from where, what Max has said or not, but about the very, very serious nature of how the bonding happens. It shows up later in the trial, in the lifelong solidarity as a revolutionary, that it's, it's a level of belonging to the movement and being a serious revolutionary with a code of conduct that I'd never really read about before or experienced. There was that part, and is that part about political organizing that's a different level of, of dedication. I struggle for words for the depths of it. Thank you. So let's move into people's impressions of, um, of Asada's descriptions of her arrest, imprisonment, um, and, and court proceedings. Big impression I got from that was just how, how African and American people were still in that time and I'm sure still now underneath the facade of the judicial system just still being treated as less than human or three-fifths human or 
just in in her constant just the abuse she received constantly throughout it and the and the, how fixed everything seemed to be against her with the solitary confinement and the way the doctors were treating her around her uh, health problems and her pregnancy and just how the courts were puppet courts basically and how everything was just controlled how they were picked basically and controlled and it just seemed to be and the impression I get from other histories of that period is that was just the general experience of most especially political prisoners of the time. Yeah thanks Russ. Yeah pretty brutal. Yeah so for for those who didn't read the book she when she was arrested uh, was beaten pretty severely dragged into a a hospital having received a gunshot wound and as well as physical abuse yeah and then and then spends is what four four years or so moving from prison to to prison for a number of different trumped up charges there's a chart in the book that shows one two three four five six seven different made-up charges that that the new york and new jersey police systems as well as the federal um, United States justice system had charged her with there were things that she clearly didn't do yeah and then she was just kind of uh, she was put in solitary confinement a bunch she was held in a in a men's prison for a, a huge section of that time in the basement of a men's prison in a, a place that wasn't even intended to be a, a holding cell for prisoners by herself without access to, to people really at all anyway so just to give give um a little bit for those who who may not have read the book so so yeah obviously horrific um treatment of her so let's let's go ahead and jump in i mean people can feel free to to say more about that if you want but but let's also do that within the context as we wrap up evangela davis's questions from her forward what was asada made to represent and what ideological work has that representation performed for kind of the culture at large like why would they why would they go through all this trouble the the police systems that that did all of that they they picked a person to do that with yeah go ahead Angela yeah it seems like to gain political points whoever you know whoever was um, trying to was in control of the government or trying to get control of the government at that time um, yeah it just seems like you demonize some people and then you gain political points and then you see that happening again. Uh, so yeah, it, it seems like it was that. And the amount of evidences that were fabricated as written in the book, that's just very surprising. So it's just one person and she's detailing her account. But if we think about how many people went through that, it's just, it was very surprising given that when we think about FBI and see all the international, I think, crime policing organizations, they proud themselves in being honest and in their integrity, but it just seems like it's not there at all. Yeah, thank you. What other thoughts do people have? I'd like to read a little bit from her statement to my people. On July 4th, 1973, it was broadcast to many radio stations. And she said, I have declared war on the rich who prosper on our poverty the politicians who lie to us with smiling faces and all the mindless, heartless robots who protect them and their property. I am a black revolutionary. And as such, I am a victim of all the wrath, hatred and slander that America is capable of. Like all other black revolutionaries, America is trying to lynch me. I think that pretty much sums it up. So that's what she represented was the black revolutionary. And they threw everything they possibly could at her because that's what America does to any kind of threat to its power. And then I'd also like to say what she represents to me from reading this book and what her life taught me is what a real revolutionary is. I can't let go of some of the things that she did in the face of that state oppression. I mean, the scene where her lawyer is reading off what's happening to her as she's being beaten on the courtroom floor. That kind of, no matter what, I'll fight. Thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, I think the level of suffering that she experienced in prison, she really articulated that well. You know, she was tortured, brutalized, but she never gave up. So I think, really, they're scared of her. They're scared of people like her. And in answer to the question, how is she represented? Well, she hasn't been represented enough. You know, that, that book isn't just 
an educational book. It's actually a really exciting book and it should be a Hollywood film, you know, but there, there's no way they'll ever make it because they're too scared. So how has she been represented? Not enough, really. She should be, you know, every school kid should be reading her book. And yeah. I need to read it again. That's one thing that's really come across by this because mm. when I read it, I just gobbled it up because it was, I wanted to read the next page and I, I really needed to have been paying more attention. So I'm going to do some homework and read it again. I'm thinking about how she you can see these competing narratives really being set up where, you know, from her narrative and the narrative of her supporters, she's a revolutionary. She's a freedom fighter. She is fighting back and organizing against a dominant power structure that is impoverishing her people. That's exploiting them brutally first through stealing them from Africa and slavery. And then through all sorts of, the Jim Crow laws and the segregation era and labor exploitation and prison labor and banking and, and all these different types of exploitation over the years to the present. And that's a really coherent, compelling narrative, right? It's it like, there's so much truth in that narrative and, and how they're putting it forward. And then you see to what extent the state and the ruling class has to mobilize so many resources to present their their opposite narrative to that in which you know she's deranged she's a cop killer she's a radical she's an extremist you know she just is rabidly out to hate white people you know and one of the things that she writes herself is quote one of the most important things the black panther party did was to make it really clear who the enemy was not white people, but the capitalist imperialist oppressors. And so it's clear in many ways how the state and the ruling class sort of sets up this racial narrative to try to get poor and working class white people to identify with the ruling class and participate in racism and participate in the imperialist system and identify with that rather than really recognizing that a lot of their class interests do align with poor and oppressed black people, you know, indigenous people, people of color who are exploited, you know, in different ways and to different degrees, of course. But, uh, you know, that's really striking to me to see the book really shows those two narratives competing. And, you know, one is the very grassroots narrative that's just being built on the streets by average people. And then the other one is having millions of dollars poured into it in mass media and newspapers and police unions and all the, you know, government officials and all these uh, institutions uh, putting their power behind that. Yeah, agreed. Um, that was really striking to me too, those two narratives. And Lennox Hines wrote another foreword in the book. He was a, a lawyer who represented lots of different black political prisoners during that time. And one thing that, that he points out is that there was an ad that came out in the daily news paid for by banking interests that showed mugshots of lots of different people who were supposedly accused of being bank robbers, showing that, that this was a, a fight that they were having to fight was to deal with all these damn bank robbers. And two months after Asada Shakur had been acquitted of the second of the, the trials that she was put through um, when she was accused of bank robbery, she was acquitted of both of them. And two months after the second one was when this ad came out in the Daily News with her mugshot prominently featured as a supposed bank robber. That kind of just political, you know, misinformation and, and nobody's going to challenge that and, and thousands of people are going to see it. Maybe millions of people are going to see it. And that's that's all they, they know is those those media images that come across their radar screen yeah i think there's so much to be learned from that how the government reacted to to that movement and how they oppressed it and i suppose fought against it and the media as you mentioned the media i think is just it's at the central of all of efforts to to control people's perspectives and to i suppose it's a form of divide and conquer in many ways it's it's a it's a story that's been going on for a long long time and it's reflected very well in the book and it is and it's repetitive and it's always been done by by those in charge it's been done for a long long time those with the power to to divide people and to to stop any kind of actual change happening like we see it now with anybody yeah general terms criminal terrorist anarchist can be thrown around and uh where there's much more depth to, to groups and to people who are organizing and to movements than than just these kind of blanket terms that don't really mean anything apart from well they've just got 
they're just derogatory basically and a simplification of what's actually going on so and yeah i think the media doing yeah there's a lot of analysis i don't think i could do it right now about how how you could stop that happening in future movements or how you could combat that but yeah media control is central for me it's like just how people are, have their perspectives controlled so easily by by the media and uh get even not just not just controlled but i suppose there's it's brainwashing at the end of the day isn't it it's, it's di literally directing mass populations in in a certain ideological direction or action and we're seeing it more and more and getting worse and worse if anything with with the internet and social media etc thanks ross one of the things that popped into my head about the perfect way to combat this would be to make this book required reading for middle schoolers period <laughs> You don't get away with that because we're going to teach them better from the very beginning. I think there's also an incredible lesson in reading first per, you know, their own words, in your own words. This book makes things pale by comparison that are written about people's lives that aren't directly from them. I love what was said in this group about that. Yeah. So I'm going to read from page 223 in my version of the book. She says, one of the best things about struggling is the people you meet. Before I became involved, I never dreamed such beautiful people existed. Of course, there were some creeps, but I can say without the slightest hesitation that I've been blessed with meeting some of the kindest, most courageous, most principled, most informed and intelligent people on the face of the earth. I owe a great deal to those who have helped me, loved me, taught me, and pulled my coat when I was moving in the wrong direction. If there's such a thing as luck, I've had an abundance of it. And those ones who have brought it to me are my friends and comrades. So anyway, I feel that for all of you. and. Thank you for, for coming and discussing with me today. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thank Andrew. you all. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot, everyone. That was Thank you. Really interesting. This is Max Wilbert, one of the hosts of the Green Flame podcast. I want to thank you for listening to our show and let you know a few ways that you can support the Green Flame. First, you can subscribe to our platform using the podcasting system of your choice. We're listed on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pocket Cast, and all the rest. We're even on YouTube. Leaving us a positive review or rating on these platforms helps us reach a larger audience. You can also share these shows with your friends. If you're interested in donating to support the production of The Green Flame, please visit deepgreenresistance.org. And finally, the goal of this show is to activate people. So if you really want to support this show, start organizing in your own community. Thank you again for listening.